I hope that everyone can hear me well, um, also on the online live stream. So let's get going. Wakey, wakey. It's um, almost um, time for the end of the conference. This is the closing, one of the two closing keynotes. And I have some bad news here for you. Uh, please, please let's see a show of hands. Who in here is actually a tester or calls themselves a tester? Okay, good. That's the time now to actually go and leave. You can uh, join Nicholas talk. <laughs> no, just kidding. So testing without testers. Um, I'll share a secret with you. Um, actually, uh, testers are needed much more than uh, any time before. So bear with me and we'll discover how that is still possible to test without testers. Right. So um, testing has had a bad reputation actually over the past couple of years. So it's been uh, catastrophic and especially due to one tool that's been prevalent all the time. So I want to share that tool with you that's been bad-mouthed. It's this. It's a COVID test. And as you probably know, you know, um, it's been a, quite a pain. You know, everyone has been testing over the past two years. You know, everyone had to become a tester. Test yourselves, you know, get tested. Uh, kids staying at home, doing homeschooling as well. It's been catastrophic. So people have been poking their noses into uh, our testing business. And you see, um, again, uh, flaky tests, you know. So if the tests fail, well, you have to rerun them, test again, test again, until it's finally negative, uh, it stays negative, or you really have to go see a doctor. So jokes aside, I don't want to really um, stifle the, the importance and, um, well, all the casualties and, and everything that we've seen with uh, the, the COVID pandemic. But basically, I'm very glad to be here today, standing, talking to you in person, face to face, without a mask. And um, yeah, I think everyone can agree that it's, it's great that we don't have any of these measures anymore. Good. But anyway, so as a tester, I sometimes have the feeling that, you know, uh, there are a lot of expectations and requirements. So I brought you the, the picture of a uh, exemplary tester. Let's call him John Doe. So as a software tester, there are a lot of expectations here. For example, you have to be 25 years old. Um, then you have to have even more than that as relevant work experience and uh, if possible, 30 years in the relevant industry. What's more, you need to have coding experience in different uh, frameworks. So coding proficiency in Java, in C Sharp, in Kotlin, in Python, in React Script and so forth. What? You never heard of uh, React Script? Well, that's because it hasn't been invented yet. Still, it's yet a requirement. On top of that, you should be active GitHub contributor in a lot of different projects, and you should have expert working knowledge in a number of testing frameworks. And maybe uh, most importantly of all, I don't know if you've heard that, I've heard that uh, a lot of times, the question, has everything been tested? And the only viable answer you can give is, because, you know, what does everything mean? Do you mean integration tests? Do you mean unit tests? On what, test, on, on what system do you want us to test? So that's a requirement as well that you have actually tested everything. So 100%. Right. So jokes aside, I know um, I'm taking a bit of a, a piss here out, out of the whole uh, subject. But um, basically, um, I would want you to actually um, take out your smartphones and now actually go to Slido and um, discover that question together with me. So there's the statement, less seems to be known about software testing than about any other aspect of software development. So I'd like you to actually um, go to the Slido, I've got it here, um, enter the code BRX and enter this poll. So you rather tend to agree, fully agree, partially agree, you can't really say, or you're rather on the disagreement spectrum. So let's see, I'll wait for you to start participating. And as hopefully the results are filling. Okay, one participant, you partially agree, excellent. Keep it going. Fully agree, okay. Do we have any disagreements here? Five people, okay, rather agreement, I would say. Some uncertainty. Okay, keep it going. 
We have 150 participants here, so I'll just wait until <laughs> everyone has answered. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, well, thanks for, for participating here. We have 70 participants, and as you can see, um, I think it's rather on the agreement side that uh, you tend to be. And that actually matches what I've seen in other conferences when I asked this question. So, for example, at Testing United a few years ago, I asked a question and there was partial agreement by 75, no, 73 participants. At Testing Automation Days, Art, you probably remember, I asked the same question and it was agreement as well. So 75% said uh, they partially agree. So this statement actually, I didn't invent that. It's actually taken from, uh, from a book, The Art of Software Testing. Nothing related to you, Art, but actually it's a classic. So it was written by Glenford J. Myers in 1979. So I was a three-year-old kid at the time this book was written. And it's uh, the first ever book purely on software testing. And uh, maybe for the next pub quiz on testing, you can keep in mind, uh, Myers is actually the person who invented the term uh, black, box test, black box testing. So keep that in mind. And actually here on the sleeve, uh, you can see uh, it says, actually, this is not the case at all, less seems to be known about software testing than about any other aspect of software development. So is it really true that after 43 years, we're still in the same situation as we used to be in the 70s? Well, there's a number of other quotes by Glenford J. Myers. So you can see here uh, what he said uh, ages ago, basically, is a good test case is a test case that has a high probability of detecting an undiscovered error, not a test case that shows that the program works correctly. So in other words, he's saying uh, tests that run green are useless because we want to discover new information. We want to discover where potential problems arise. So um, I think that was quite visionary at the time. Another quote is, we try to solve the problem of bad quality by rushing through the design process so that enough time is left at the end of the project to uncover the errors that were made because we rushed through the design process. Again, in other words, he's saying that uh, testing at the end uh, only takes place because we didn't spend enough time at the beginning of the software development process. So very advanced, very agile, and that happened in the 70s already. So he's a he's a, a luminary, and um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Glenford J. Myers for that. I'd also like to say thank you very much to the kick-ass support and engineering team at Slido, because um, I discovered about two days ago, so the Slido switcher to actually have the live view on screen didn't work, and within 24 hours, mind you, I'm a, I'm you know I'm a cheapskate freemium user. And they replied immediately and they solved my problem within 24 hours. So please give a round of applause to the Slido engineers. They're really, 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 really cool folks. Right, um, but I haven't introduced myself, so um, let's make up for that. So my name is Ron Werner. I'm principal uh, quality engineer at Kazoo, based in Munich. I've quite a lot of uh, years of experience in quality and in IT. Um, I'm married. I have three sons, we have one dog, and I would, I would like to call myself Pareto vegan. So as we heard before in Michelle's talk, you know, 20% is enough, and that's the same for me. So 20% of uh, vegan eating is, is good enough. I like my steak every now and then. Great, and I wanna share the weirdest experience in testing. That's a while ago when I was actually in Japan and testing dialogues like this, where I didn't understand a single word, and basically clicking the button, you, well, I wasn't sure if I'm going to send all my data into oblivion um, or actually store it. So um, let's dive into the question whether we actually need testers. So I guess everyone has an opinion here. And um, well, there's, there's two things that, you know, everyone comes up with. The first one is uh, automation. So the first ever software testing conference I was at, I was getting really scared because all the vendor booths, everyone was telling me 100% automation, you know, full test coverage and all automatic. So I was really afraid of losing my job. You know, now come 2022, um, I'm still here, you're still here. So I think we have good chances. So there's actually um, machine learning and AI as well. 
I did an entire talk on that subject as well a few years ago. And um, there are guys out there, there's Copado, uh, there's Whoopi as well. So, you know, go talk to these folks and um, make your own opinion, basically. But I think um, both of these things, automation, machine learning, AI, these are further tools in your tool belt that you can use as a quality person. So I don't think this is going to replace your job anytime soon. And um, I brought one example here. So this is a nice Swiss copy maker, the Ina 8 Touch. And what they claim here, actually, it's been tested. It was, you know, very good. <laughs> and um, what you can see here on the screen, or maybe not. Anyway, they say innovations. Künstliche Intelligenz, artificial intelligence. So the most uh, ordered products are listed on, on the top places of the display. Now, that's, that's not machine learning, let alone artificial intelligence at all. That's a very old programming principle called LIFO, last in, first out, uh, a queuing mechanism. So as you can see, there are a lot of marketing claims. So um, keep an open mind about that and you know, stay tuned and you'll still be needed as testers. But we can also ask the question, do we need developers? So the talk might as well have been labeled um, developing without developers. Because there's been tools around as well. So we have GitHub Copilot, you might have heard of that. So it was established two years ago. It's an automatic IDE kind of code completion tool that helps you develop code that is learning using machine learning algorithms. And uh, the latest kit on the block is AWS Code Whisperer that does pretty much the same things, but in an uh, Amazon AWS environment. Now with this, I found there are two studies that uh, actually took a closer look at, uh, at Copilot. And it turned out that uh, so far, one study said the quality of code produced um, was actually inferior. So uh, th there was a trial of um, of uh, pairs of, of developers pairing up with, with the uh, co-pilot versus pairing up with a, a real developer. And uh, therefore actually um, the, the code quality was inferior. So many more lines of code uh, produced by co-pilot were actually deleted. And also 40% of the code um, created by co-pilot included bugs that posed serious security risks. So, I think we're still not there that we're not needed, neither as developers nor as testers. So don't worry about that. Right, so I investigated a little more and um, I took a look at jokes because jokes represent culture, right? They present popular culture. And um, I took a look at um, jokes about testers and developers. Uh, but first of all, maybe let's take a look at jokes that have been around. For example, in the 80s and 19s, 90s, there have been blonde jokes. They disappeared, uh, fortunately. Um, and in the in, end of the 90s, in 89, there was an event in Germany, the German reunification. So as you can see, East Germany and West Germany, after having been separated for 40 years, finally reunited. And, you know, two cultures became one again. And, you know, this was a a uh, nice event, you know, families reunited, friends saw each other again. Um, so, you know, but it has been a bit of a love-hate relationship then. So, for example, you might remember this car. This is called the Trabant. So it's a Trabi. And uh, it's quite cheap. It's very light. Uh, it's not very fast. And it has a plastic coating. So there's been lovely jokes from Western Germans about the Eastern Germans and, and vice versa. And I want to share an example here. So, for example, the West Germans, they, they would ask uh, this question. When does a Trabi reach its top speed? When it's towed away. So uh, now I need to crack a joke about the West Germans as well, obviously, to keep equality. Um, so the East Germans would crack a joke uh, saying after the reunification, what's the difference between the Russians and the West Germans? We managed to get rid of the Russians. So, um, yeah, jokes aside, but this shows this has been a local phenomenon. These jokes have been around. And nowadays, 30 years later, after the reunification, you don't hear them anymore. Now, I tried to find some jokes about developers and testers. And to be honest, I had a hard time finding some tester jokes. So does that mean that testers don't really have humor or a sense of humor? 
Um, you know, develop jokes, there's the Chuck Norris jokes, you have the Dilbert jokes, you have a whole series of the IT crowd and so on. So there's a lot. But I found two jokes um, that really represent the current state of what's going on in testing. And I want to share them with you. So the first joke goes, you might have heard that, a QA enters a bar, orders a beer, orders minus one beers, orders zero beers, orders nine gazillion beers, orders beers, orders a lizard. Then the first real customer enters the bar um, and asks where the bathroom is. The whole bar explodes, you know, sending everything into oblivion. So I see a couple of smiles, so it's funny. Um, but there is a certain side kick or an elbow kick here, a certain side taste, because it kind of claims that, you know, the testers try everything uh, to, you know, find a flaw and only the real customer then discovers uh, the critical bugs that makes the whole bar explode, right? So keep the smell in mind. There's another joke that I wanted to present to you, uh, which is about a man in a balloon who lost his way. Um, so it goes as follows. Man in a balloon lost his way, so um, he lowers altitude and as he approaches the ground, he sees a woman. So he's shouting down. Excuse me, can you help me? I promised a friend to meet him half an hour ago and uh, I don't know where I am. So the woman replies, yes, of course. Um, you're in a hot air balloon perched approximately 30 meters above the ground and you're located at 56 degrees, uh, 40, 42 um, northern uh, longitude and 32 degrees, 39 western uh, latitude. Now, the hot air driver, hot air balloon driver replies, you must be a tester. The woman says, oh, I am, but how did you know? Well, technically everything you told me is correct, but I don't know what to make of it and I'm still lost. So to be frank, you've been no help at all. Now, the woman replies, you must be in management. The balloonist says, yes, I am, but how did you know? Well, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You gave a promise that you cannot keep and you've risen to the position you're in to a due to a large quantity of hot air. Now you expect people beneath you to actually solve your problems. Before we met, uh, you're still in the same situation as we are now, but somehow it's now my problem. <laughs> so you see, it's, it's really funny. Um, but there's also a, a sidekick, right? An elbow kick. So it goes that, okay, testers get blamed for everything, you know, uh, although it's not their fault. I mean, the, we're just testing the system, right? A fault that has been there before will be discovered, right? And we didn't produce it. So you see, um, jokes reveal something about the culture. And, uh, you know, this has been going on, you know, the, the row between testers and management and developers. So, You've probably seen this. It's kind of the old, you know, uh, battle between the developers and, and the testers. Ah, there's a critical bug. No, it's not. I, I want, let's reproduce it. No, I can't reproduce it. You know, let's close it. I'll open it and so forth. All this ping pong. And ping pong that goes on in, in Jira as well, just using Jira comments. So, uh, you know, that's pretty boring. So um, how can we proceed from here? How do we arrive at a better sense of togetherness? And I want to share with you one way that I see is the way forward. That is, we need quality coaches. Now, I'm not sure if anyone has seen or watched uh, the actual GTAC 2011 keynote, Test is Dead, where Alberto Savoia actually labored the point that if you're a manual tester, you don't progress, you don't develop yourself, um, you know, nothing's gonna happen. So this is not the world that we're gonna live in. So did anyone watch this keynote? One hand, okay. Um, I highly recommend you watching that because that's also the, the topic or the motto for this conference is test dead again. And so uh, the point he labors is actually, he wants us to, to build the right it, the right thing, rather than building the, the it right, so building the thing right. 
And what he refers to has been stated by the management guru, Peter Drucker. So he said that efficiency is concerned with doing things right. Yeah. So building the right thing. Effectiveness is doing the, the right things. But doing the right things is maybe just in your test phase uh, when, it, when the actual thing is you have to have the right product and release it to users, friendly users that will then forgive you if there's a problem or a bug with it. Like me, you know, um, having a problem with Slido, they fixed it. It's, it's great. I'm a super happy customer. And I'll probably upgrade very soon. So um, you see, um, it's building the right it, and that's where quality coaches can help. And here, I'm really, really thankful to uh, Areti Panu, who was a speaker at last year's Sanai Birex conference, who talked about the fact that if I'm not a tester in, in a team, how can I help? And so what quality coaches do are three things, basically. So the first one is quality coaches can inspire. So they ask, how can you cultivate quality beyond pure testing? And there's a couple of things you can do. You could take a look at the CI steps, for example, and analyze if there are any problems. So are there obstacles in the flow, anything slowing you down from uh, or uh, slowing down your release cycles? You can look at customer input, trust pilot scores, for example, or anything that the, the support has to tell you what, what the customer thinks about your product. The second one is you can ask good questions. That's what testers can do very well. And you should teach. So how can you get others involved in quality? And there's also a number of things that you can do. So uh, you can try to get a shared understanding of why we want quality. So obviously, if anyone else on the team is not uh, really keen on having quality, then why should you try going for that? You also need to get rid of the sign off mentality that, you know, you're kind of responsible for, you know, uh, triggering the release because now you put your sign of approval. So Get rid of that and enter quality enablement so everyone is involved. You also can teach good testing practice. You know, as testers, we're good at creating test cases, at knowing what needs to be tested and why and how. So let's share this knowledge. And you have to trust others in your team. You know, um, trust them to actually also build in good quality from the start, even when you're not there. And the third one is, as a coach, you can challenge others. So how can you distribute quality efforts? So um, you can identify quality tasks in your software development lifecycle. You can discuss the quality tasks with your team members, and you can share the ownership of that. And with that, doing engineering well, actually, in this DevOps loop, um, courtesy of Janet Gregory, who um, nicely allowed me to, to use that in, in my talk, engineering well as a quality coach or a quality engineer as we call them at Kazoo, requires a continuous and deliberate effort. That means it's not just a one-off action that you do. No, you have to keep on doing it. And it's deliberate. So you really want, you need, you need to want to do it and you have to, you have to um, put in some, some effort. To build and evolve healthy quality habits. And that's exactly what I want to talk about a little more. In this uh, DevOps cycle, you can see like the left hand side of the loop is the development phase where you start building something after having planned. Uh, and the right hand side is the, the ops side where you deploy, then you monitor, you observe what's happening and you gain new ideas from uh, your production systems. And so these are the three pillars that we work with at, at Kazoo. So shifting left as a quality engineer or quality coach, shifting right, and uh, whole team quality. So basically seeing quality as a team sport. As a tester, you might test sometimes, uh, but it's not your main responsibility. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about habits. So what are good quality habits? And how can you flex your quality muscles to develop these habits? That's what I want to go a bit more in detail now. So habit is defined in Cambridge Dictionary as something that you do often and regularly, sometimes without knowing that you're doing it. So that means it's something that you do subconsciously without knowing that you're doing it. And you're doing it regularly, like a daily routine, right? So how does that 
tie in and how can you develop a habit? So I have a question for you. How long do you think it takes to develop a routine, to adopt successfully a new habit? I have four options for you, 14 days, 21 days, 66 days, boy, that's long, or eight months, even longer. So let's see a show of hands. Who thinks it's 14 days? A few hands, 21 days, many more hands, okay, 66 days, a few, and eight months, also a few. Okay, so actually, um, instinctively, you've been right. 21 days has been the, sorry, has been the accepted value for a number of years, actually since the 60s. So Maxwell Waltz actually published this book, uh, it's got a quite creepy name, Psycho-Cybernetics. So he's, um, he's a plastic surgeon and he actually evaluated how long does it take uh, for patients after a nose job, for example, to accept their new uh, self being in the mirror. And in his book, actually, he talks about a minimum of 21 days. Now, the minimum has been left out. And ever since, you know, all the proclaimed self-healing, self-improvement gurus, they have just taken this number as 21 days. Actually, um, this has been superseded in 2009 when we had a study by UCL scientist Philippa Lally. So she's a professor of uh, psycholo psychology and she did some research uh, with some uh, users. So she asked, how long does it actually take for you to um, develop a new habit? Like something simple, like uh, drinking a glass of water every morning or uh, brushing your te teeth three times a day or going for a 10 minute run every day. And she came up that, you know, it's anything between 66 days, so that's the minimum, up to eight months. So it's a long time. So you can see 66 days, that's more than two months. Building up quality habits is not, not something that you can do quickly. So Rome also wasn't built in a day. So, you know, it takes time, it takes deliberate efforts. Right. So let's look at behaviors on the opposite side. So behavior is defined in Cambridge Dictionary again as the way that someone or something behaves in a particular situation. That's quite different here. So you see a behavior is something that you consciously do. It's not something uh, out of your daily routine, but there's one situation, it's a singular event, where you actually decide to act in a certain way. Now, how does this tied together? Well, the Handbook of Behavior Change by Cambridge Press, I'm mentioning a lot of Cambridge uh, scientific uh, research here, but they say unlike motivational models of behavior change, habit formation has the potential to create sustained behavior change. So that means habits that you keep up. And how can you actually have this behavior change? So how does that tie in? So I give you one example. So when I started at Kizu, there was uh, an unconscious habit. You know, when joining online meetings in Google Meet, um, everyone was, was actually uh, clicking the raise hand button if they wanted to say something. And to me, that was unusual because before in online meetings, you know, if nobody was talking, I would just jump in and ask my question or, uh, you know, um, put in my statement. And that was something that existed already as, as a habit, as part of the culture. Um, so. I started adapting that actually, and it was a behavior that, that I adapted. And I've seen, I've become a big, big, big friend of that now. So um, it's really something that where I actually adapted my behavior to meet the habits and, and the culture of the company. So how does that tie in with culture? Culture is defined as the attitudes, the behavior, the opinions, and so on of a particular group of people within society or within your work environment. Now, you see behavior is repeated here. So behaviors are part of the culture. And obviously, it's not that easy to form or shape culture. But basically, it all builds up with habits that form behaviors that then become part of your culture in, in a company or within a society. So culture contains certain customs and beliefs and a way of lifestyle. And how do you actually uh, put everything together now? So this is all one big system. 
And I want to explore how do you actually install a great culture. So you start with good habits. Good quality habits, they actually lead to good quality behaviors. And that will create a great company culture, a great quality culture. On the opposite side, if you have some bad habits, then that will lead to bad behaviors because people adapt bad habits into their behaviors that they consciously act. And that will lead to a toxic culture. So how does that all tie in and how does it work at the company I work at, uh, Kazoo? So Kazoo, we're an online car selling business. Um, so it was founded in 2019. It's pretty huge, 5,000 employees at the beginning of this year, around 500 people in the tech organization. And I don't want to do much advertising here, but basically um, we've done a lot of things right from the beginning. So we took care of diversity, psychological safety, uh, using agile from the beginning. So from the beginning, this was part of the culture that was installed. And um, yeah, how, how did we achieve this at, at Kazoo actually? So there's one team setup um, that is pretty similar in all tech teams that we have um, for all components. So there are um, software engineers, there's an engineering manager, there's a quality engineer, uh, there's a, a, a product, product owner as well, or product manager, and there would be a UX person for the design and the, the user interactions. Right, now you're saying, ah, I get it. You just relabeled the testers with the word quality engineer. But well, that's, that's not right, because uh, for us, testers actually, I will show on the next slide what they do. So our quality engineers. So we also had to change the, or provide the environment for doing so. So psychological safety, being able to speak up, you know, um, flat hierarchies, you know, um, and uh, forming part of the culture. So what do quality engineers do at Kizu? So quality engineers are neither expected to test the output of software engineers nor act as release gatekeepers. So um, that means we might test sometimes, but uh, we're not siloed, we're not, uh, you know, quality sign of people at all. Instead, quality engineers should be involved in discovery activities to surface information, discover new things, discover unknowns and surface risks as early as possible. Right? Nothing new so far. Quality engineers will also be involved in three Amigo style conversations. So we actually call them the power of X. So um, it's, you know, where multiple people get together. We've heard about that a couple of times today in diverse talks um, to actually discuss the requirements before a story gets started. So these conversations are gone through from inception through to operating software in, so in production. And QEs will be found pairing with designers and software engineers as needed. QEs also drive a culture of testability because you can only test when you have the ability to test something. If you have test data, if you have an according um, environment, for example, um, do you have to order a real car on the website or do we actually have some, some test cars? So is there testability and is there observability as well? So being able to see what real users are doing in production and how our production systems behave or any other environments that you might want to watch. And finally, QA, QEs use their subject matter expertise. We're testers, we specialize in you know, asking good questions, surfacing risks, and so forth, to coach software engineers on appropriate test scenarios and testing levels, while the software engineers are expected to write automation around their code, as well as writing the code themselves. So here, quality engineers might write some automation, but they're not expected to. It's actually, they're pairing up with developers to help them develop automation. Now, how do you actually go about that? How do you create a good habit? And how do you break a bad habit? So we've just heard from Gabriel in, in the other room about motivation and how you build that up uh, to become the best marathon runner of uh, Slovakia, for example. So it's hard, but everything, also a marathon starts with the first step. So I've taken a look at the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. You might have seen or read that. And uh, there are some, some pieces of advice here. So if you want to start a new good habit, for example, um, you want to start running, make it easy. You know, get some fancy running shoes like uh, you've seen with Gabriel, you know, 
make it fun really and, and have them uh, ready. So it's easy to slip in and go running every day. Make it fun. Make it attractive as well, you know, get a different set of running costumes, you know, trunks and whatever, uh, you know, so you, you actually start believing in yourself and you look good when running, even though you might have a big belly and, and whatnot, but, um, you know, start doing, doing that and, and making it attractive. The next step is to make it obvious, you know, don't hide your running gear, you know, put it right into your view. So, sorry. So put it right in your view. So you see it all the time and you get reminded of it all the time. So you cannot leave your, your front door without seeing your running gear and reminding you that you should go running. Make it satisfying as well. So once you've taken the step to go running every day for 10 minutes, for example, um, then treat yourself. So relax, uh, have fun with your friends, go watch a movie, do whatever does you some well. On the other hand, how to break a bad habit, it's just exactly the opposite. So it's, in theory, very simple. So you have to make it difficult, you have to make it unattractive, make it invisible and unsatisfying. So if you want to stop eating chocolate, for example, okay, you can make it difficult. Don't buy chocolate anymore, right? Make it unattractive. Um, if you still have some chocolate or you bought some, hide it somewhere in the basement, in the cellar, you know, where you have to walk for a long time to actually get it. Make it invisible as well. You know, get rid of it anywhere in your fridge, in your cupboards, wherever. Just no chocolate anywhere to be seen, right? And make it unsatisfying. You could go and enter a bet with your friends that if you actually eat some chocolate, you know, you have to pay them 100 euros. So that hurts and that's really unsatisfying. But I've brought with me some examples from software development. So how to create a good habit? Um, introducing test-driven development. You know, test-driven development in combination with pairing is awesome. I'm a huge advocate for TDD because what it does is you actually start developing an excellent code coverage from the beginning. When doing TDD, uh, your tests actually guide the logic of your implementation. So your code is really logical and it's easy to read. And it's also a joy uh, to, to change it because you have the test coverage in, in case things go wrong and to add on to it, it's really nice. Plus, it's an excellent tool for knowledge transfer. So if you do pairing using test-driven development um, with, with seniors and juniors, then there's a lot of knowledge transfer as well. But anyway, I'll stop now. Um, how can you make it easy? So for pairing on TDD, uh, we were using a great tool called Pesto. So that makes it easy to pair also online there was another tool called Mob, where you could actually switch uh, from one GitHub branch and easily pass it over to another one. Um, so otherwise it's quite difficult if, you, if you're not sitting physically in front of the same machine. So that made it a lot easier. We made it attractive as well. So there was, oh, there is Tech Academy at, at Kizu. So any engineer joining would enter a 16 week program uh, to learn more about TDD, about good testing practice, how to write good unit tests, and uh, why quality in software development is a good thing in general. And so, you know, quality engineers and software uh, engineers from different departments would actually join together. You get to pair, um, and it was really a, a nice experience. So it's very attractive. You get a lot of practice, um, and we did a lot of pairing and mobbing. So making it obvious is making it a topic in your daily standard, for example. You know, talk about, okay, who could actually pair up today? Um, so make it obvious and then stick to what you've agreed to in, in your daily. Um, you can also have IDE integration for, for TDD. So every time you start writing code, you know, your IDE is there to help you doing that. Making it satisfying? Well, just show, shout it out to the world, you know, showcase what you've done. So we've had a community of, of practice talking about uh, TDD for integration tests, uh, TDD using unit tests as well. So um, you obviously can demo what you've done and just display your test efforts. On the other hand, an example for breaking a bad habit is, I mean, who hasn't done that before? Releasing features without tests. Sometimes it's necessary, it's a necessary evil, uh, but you know, you have to make it difficult. How can you do that? enter CI gates. So if you cannot commit your code or uh, have a pull request, if you haven't met a certain um, code coverage, then that's really difficult to, to go ahead. Unattractive. Well, then 
whoever wrote that code has to remove the code and rewrite it. That's a pain. And uh, you can also make it invisible. So integrate the minimum code coverage, not just in your CI system, uh, whatever you're using, but you can actually have that in your IDE settings already. So on your local system, you can make sure that you, know, you have the, the respected code coverage. And unsatisfying, okay, there's peer pressure, right? You do code reviews or you do pairing. So it's quite easy um, to actually weed this out. So how that ties in with behaviors now, I took a look at another book uh, called Drive by Dan Pink. You might have uh, seen that. So Dan Pink actually ventures this three intrinsic motivations for everyone. So it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose to be good and successful at anything. Let's get rid of these post-its. And so um, how to make it a behavior? Well, autonomy, you know, leave it up to the teams to choose their technologies, you know, um, enable them to do uh, the, the things they want to do best. Mastery, we used the Code Academy, for example, to teach people um, about how to do TDD. There's purpose as well. So, uh, you know, you have to have a quality vision and you need to communicate that within the company. So. Um, my principal quality engineer colleagues and myself, uh, we've been working on this over the past year. So, uh, you know, it's a vision that needs to be known um, throughout the whole company. So you can make allies as well. So in, in your team, um, if you want to introduce something new, uh, a new habit, you know, make allies. Talk to, to other people. You know, if you want to introduce a new tool, new testing technique, um, uh, whatever, um, try to find um, like-minded people. Get support as well, you know, talk to your manager. Um, changing culture is difficult and you need C-level support as well to actually tackle the whole, the whole culture of a company. But what helps you here is to collect supporting data. So if in one team, for example, TDD works really well, get some data that shows um, that uh, the bugs that were found, for example, um, in production, um, they didn't get discovered by unit tests, but maybe by other tests. So um, find out how well whatever you're doing actually performs. And so habits form behaviors and that forms a culture. So um, Alberto Savoia actually talked about that. So um, good quality habits need to be um, in every, on everyone's mind. And um, changing a culture is difficult, very difficult. So Peter Drucker is said to have said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, he actually never said that. That was attributed to him uh, due to the former Ford CEO who actually made this term very popular. What Drucker actually said is, culture, no matter how defined, is singularly persistent. That means it's persistent. So, Culture is there, made to stay, but it's not impossible to change it. And uh, I want to go and close uh, with an excerpt, so a little clip of something that I realized that I noticed. So um, this, for example, changing or checking whether a quotation is actually correct or not, that's something that testers do. You know, you're brilliant at that, finding, finding the truth, you know, finding things out. And I want to close by showing you uh, a little excerpt, a clip from Test is Dead, where Alberto Savoia, after having given his talk, arguing that you need to build the right thing then, rather than building the thing right, he goes into comments and questions. Which should be an extremely exciting thing. So, as I said, the leaders are moving out. You know, the old guard is moving out. The old ways of developing are gone. There is a huge opportunity for people here in terms of the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion to come up with something extremely new. And, you know, if you're lucky, you could be <coughs> the next James Whitaker. Uh, no, a bad example. <laughs> so, uh, hope, is there anybody here that? Would love for that to happen. You know, there have to be some new ideas and new ways of approaching testing. Any suggestions from this audience? Yes. So he's actually oh, looking you know. for new ideas, and that's 11 well, years ago. It's there. This is the opening keynote. Uh, 
uh, well, first of all, because I would have, I, 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 uh, agree to do nothing but the opening keynote, but also because this is the theme of the conference, right? If test is dead as far on the horizon, what are we going to do about it? When you sit at those tables, that's what you should be thinking about. So exactly. Sometimes you think, you know, so testing is dead, probably get it for quite a job. And my comment on this is uh, we really need to reinvent ourselves. When I work, I hate the word testers because I think we're really quality people and quality should be implemented all across uh, the development life cycle. So we just need to reinvent ourselves and stop calling ourselves as, as testers. We're just like process monitors. We're quality people. We, we, really, we really need to put quality in every step of the development life cycle. So by the time the, the code gets to us, which is uh, the QA phase, uh, like James has said, uh, it'll be testing. We hope it doesn't. But uh, again, for everyone, you know, it's not testing, what we do is quality assurance, and we really need to make sure monitor it and have it implemented all across. Uh, that's just my comment. Agree? Disagree? Well, I, we start agreeing, then we have two more questions. In fact, if, let, let's make up a term. So that's the clip. And um, I want to stress the fact that, you know, Alberto Savoya, unfortunately, he just brushed over this comment, and, you know, there were further questions, but I think. What this chap said really, really, really struck a note with me. So um, I have a still from, from the video, and it really hit me straight in the face. Because what this unknown chap here is saying is, we're quality people. We really need to put quality in every step of the development life cycle. And mind you, that's 2011. That's really, it's visionary. It's an absolute inspiration, and it's just been brushed over. So this gentleman, without knowing, um, if you know who that is, please let me know, because I'd like to say thank you. Uh, but anyway, so maybe without knowing, uh, he might have inspired the next generation of quality people. And so I want to show you actually on a timeline uh, the event of, well, agile testing things happening. So in 2001, as you know, the Agile Manifesto was established by Kent Beck and 16 other, other people. Then in 2009, who knows what happened in 2009, a book was released. Bitcoin was created and the book Agile Testing was released by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. So talking about the Agile Testing Quadrants, that was mind blowing and really revolutionary. So um, then a while there was nothing until in 2016, we started talking about continuous testing inspired by Dan Ashby who actually uh, showed the DevOps infinity loop and mentioned that, you know, we have to test everywhere and we can test everywhere. And that's been picked up by Janet Gregory in 2021 uh, with her term holistic testing. So she built up on that theme. Now, in 2011, in between, this has been an absolute inspiration saying, putting quality into every step of the software development life cycle. And this gentleman here is really my unsung hero because he mentioned something that was really inspirational and revolutionary that kind of helped or may have not helped or without him knowing might have helped other people to get inspiration for where testing is going. That's what Alberto Savoia was asking for, new people and new ideas in testing. And so I'm hoping that we're in 2022. I'm hoping that the term quality engineering, and not just the term, but the idea of quality engineering with the three pillars of shifting left, shifting right, and whole team quality might be an inspiration to you to come up with the next ideas for how we can improve quality in the future. And so I want to close with this slide showing again that, you know, doing engineering well requires a continuous and deliberate effort to build and evolve healthy quality habits, the three pillars that us at Kazoo are working uh, with that, how quality habits lead to quality behaviors, and finally, they also shape a quality culture, and how you can start to create a good habit. So keep that in mind. Great. I want to say thank you to a number of people. First of all, Areti Pano, who was here last year for the inspiration for this talk. I want to say thank you to Janet Gregory as well for allowing me to use her DevOps Infinity Loop. And I'd like to say thank you to my colleagues, Anto Caboni, Andrew Fraser, Peter Hayworth-Langford, Jem Hill, 
Nicholas Sedgwick and Anna Sousa. Uh, together, we've actually created the quality vision for Kazoo and uh, we've, we've implemented it. So, and before I'd like to say thank you to you for listening, um, I'd like to extend if you have any good QA or tested jokes, please share because I've only found two. Thank you very much.